Okay, so now we're we're coming back in. Um, in if you write your own functions, does it auto assist? You know, show you the parameters too. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. So your functions, so long as they are uh, 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 confirmed by um, the, you see the outline pa panel here. So. I have noticed, and this is, again, this is a problem with the extension itself. As it is something basic, there are some things that sometimes fail. And I have noticed that some functions do not get drawn here, uh, maybe because of the way how it was reading and so, so on. But as long as I see it, if I start typing GDI, it, it will actually show me the function with the parameters, especially if I say draw ellipse. So I have them all and and there's something that sometimes I haven't seen it right now, but when you, ah, right. So it gives you a glimpse of what the parameters are. This is very good when you're using them. So let me go ahead and find you an example of what I mean. So here, um, so he was using the draw lips several times and I see that he's passing parameters to them. And I see this two times R, what the heck is he passing to it? So I put them the, the position here and I see that that parameter is the W, so that's the width. So this two times R, it's the width of the ellipse that he's actually drawing. So this is very, very handy, even if the function you actually wrote it yourself. You might say like, okay, but he didn't write the GDI library. Yeah, but as soon as you have a function here declared, like my function, param one, param two, and then you define what that function does. Uh, later on, when I try to access my func, you will see the parameters defined in there. So it does it automatically. You don't have to do anything. So long as you defined it, it will be there. And as soon as you put the, the mouse on top of it, it's gonna tell you the parameters of it. So if you have very good names for your parameters, I could figure out very quick, quickly what's going on with that function. And then we had a couple questions about uh, the debugging um, earlier. Marche asked to use, uh, let me try to find it. He, he was asking if you could debug a very specific uh, GUI, something GUI, GUI size. That's what it okay. was. Yeah, of course. You can debug. You can well, debug. He wants you to actually demonstrate it because he knows it really well. And just, it'd be a, it's a tricky example with um, GUI size. Okay, so we're going to have a, a, a small GUI. Let's go ahead and do that real quick. So let's go ahead and create a GUI. Um, add an edit button, uh, edit control. Uh, let's make it 200. Um, in show. Now, what you want me to do very likely is to turn here, GUI size, and say, for example, uh, GUI control. Am I? Okay, that's the reason why I'm not getting that. So if you're not getting your suggestions and stuff, it's because you're not in the Arawaki language. So we control, and it, that's where uh, I think we would move it. Let's go ahead and do that. So let me add a variable to it, my edit. What I want to do is, Actually, I don't even have to do anything. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, tape. Uh, uh, and this is one of the most interesting things. L notice that I'm not typing the things correctly. So I just started typing a GUI all together, even though I know that it has an underscore, but I could, it, it actually suggests things exactly as I type them. I don't have to write the correct stuff. It is gonna suggest me what to type. It's a fuzzy I'm gonna have it. Is. Yes. Now let me go ahead and do something because my computer is deciding to go like, uh, <laughs> it is, uh, let me pass this off so that it doesn't take resources. <laughs> so um, let's do this. Let's go ahead and run this script. Um, let me save it first as uh, something temp. Let's go ahead. Um, no, let's, oh, 
I did something, oh well, it was temporal, this replace it, it doesn't matter. So this is my, um, my uh, script. I just, just right there, there's kind of like a 33 thing right there, right? I typed something wrong here, that's why I'm missing something. Um, but this tooltip was created by my GUI size, but I am interested in what is going on. So something didn't work out correctly. I want to know what it is. I place um, a breakpoint there. I refresh my script and oh, hold on. So the phone. Let me place the break on top of it before it even starts from. And I could see, oh, that's what he meant. So some things cannot be stepped into in that particular fashion because they're called in a different way. But let me see something because I think I could break into it in certain other situations. He dealt with breaking into the, the GUI size before. So I was not sure if that was something that. So I know that when you minimize and you maximize, the tooltip um, is called, but I have never actually seen that before. Again, this is one of those things that might be either a problem with the um, with the extension itself rather than um, um, the of the debugging yeah. tool itself. Yeah. It, those are some of the limitations. And somebody, I think they asked me like, um, what do you mean by basic debugging? I, I think I saw that question. Um, there are some things that you might not have access to in debug mode um, without adding more parameters to it. Now, I know that I could debug a GUI size um, um, I guess he gave up. <laughs> yeah, his internet sometimes or power will cut out. But uh, um, overall, it's a pretty powerful tool, I think. Did anyone else have any other questions? We saw they were saying GUI size is tricky. Yeah. I don't know if he's going to be back quickly or if anyone else has. Yeah, it, it just depends. This, yeah. The. Uh, some of the other languages have a kind of cool feature in Visual Studio where if you declare a variable and then never use it, it'll be kind of a uh, grayed out kind of. It's a really fun way to you know catch uh, unneeded variables. I don't know what has to happen to make that work for auto hotkey, but it would be real killer. He's back. I'm sorry about that. Seems like my connection dropped there, <laughs> and it is funny because it it dropped as soon as I, as soon as um, this thing actually <laughs> kind of like stepped into the the code that we were talking about. But it, it, it is kind of interesting that it was not breaking before, and now it is breaking as I was expecting. Not sure if that has to do with this thing here. I think in the chat he was saying because. It's called when GUI show is, you know, in it. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when it is. And this is this is what I was expecting. So if I have if I have a break in any part of my code, as soon as auto hotkey reaches that line, it should break. Now, what happened at the beginning was unexpected to me. Like, hold on, why didn't it break? Right. Because what I'm expecting is that it breaks. It doesn't matter what you do. Now, the fact that it failed at some point tells me that there might be something that is not really um, working 100%. But now, whenever I try it, like it doesn't fail any longer. Now, as you can see, the GUI has been shown. Um, here's the GUI, right? And here on my on my code, the tooltip hasn't been executed yet. So the tooltip is going to be executed when I tell it to execute. And now you can see the tooltip up there. You see that? And now I continue executing and now my script is running. Now, as I have a break in there, when I minimize, it should break again. Now, what I was expecting to happen is happening. <laughs> so now that I minimized, 
Now the GUI size get fired up again. So now it's breaking again. So for some reason it was not breaking and I'm not really sure why. But the, the real challenge, uh, Isaias, would be if your GUI was resizable and then this GUI size uh, code would be called multiple time in a row, you know, a, that, that would be... a second, <laughs> and then the debugger would, would go crazy with that. Right, uh, it would, because <laughs> it is being called many times, but not exactly. It is not gonna go crazy by it. What is gonna happen is that it's not gonna work as you expect, but it is gonna do exactly what you're supposed to do. Check this out. I could, I could emulate what you're saying. So um, right now I do have, my code stopped. Now, down here, I have my um, icon for my program. When I click on it, it should actually, uh, let, me, let me show you. What I wanted to do is that when I click on it, it should stop working. Like it should not, there it is. Like right now, it's not working. Because as it is paused, I, I, sometimes, you know what? I'm gonna show you where. For, for the GUI size, it seems to be that it gets fired up anyways. But for certain things, like for example, the menu, if I click the menu, right click the menu, I just right click the menu, nothing happens because the script is stopped, is paused. Now, when I click on the next, you will see that then the, the things that I was trying, whatever I was trying, for example, the menu, they're gonna show up. Let me go ahead and verify, that's the temp. Okay, so let me go ahead and pause the script. I pause it. Uh, hold on, uh, let me break on it. Oh, wow. Now the script is not even showing the window. Where is it? Oh, there it is. So it's, did it break? Now, breaking on this thing is really, so now I see if I right click on it, should not work. And then you see that the menu shows up in different location. Now, let me, let me demonstrate that again. We, it didn't happen before, but this is what I was kind of like implying. Let me have it running. I have my code break here. So my code is just broke. If I right click on my icon, nothing happens, but something should happen. When I click on my next step, whatever I did gets executed. So going to the point that John was making. So if you try to resize several times, what would happen? When you start, it's gonna break and it's not gonna take any more input until you actually step to the next level and then it's going to grab whatever input you have sent before so it is a little bit tricky it's confusing it is annoying but yeah when you're working with GUI size and stuff like that yeah it's kind of like um things that are being called way too fast might be very difficult to debug um but you can stop on them and still check on what is going on um uh for so Check this out. This is something that I couldn't demonstrate a while ago. So variable one would be this thing. And I'm gonna put it here. And bar two, by the way, you have, you have um, it auto completes your, um, so what am I doing here? Oh my God, B, oh, oh, that's the thing. Ah, it doesn't matter. A, B, uh, so it doesn't matter. So I have the same code right here as I had before. I'm gonna run it. Um, so I'm gonna get the same results, right? But how about if I make a stop up here before the variables are assigned? Um, let me run it again. Now, var one has 33 in it. What if I want to change it? Let's go ahead and change that not the GUI height, the variable one, this one I do have access to it. Let's put it, I don't know, 1,520. I just changed the variable of that, uh, the, the, the contents of that variable. And let's change this one to 9999. Um, again, I have to do it before I execute that line because that line is gonna actually do that. So let me go ahead and change it to 9999. Now I haven't executed my tooltip, but I changed whatever the contents of that variable was. Now, when I show my tooltip, it's gonna to show whatever contents I actually put there. And this is extremely interesting because when I'm debugging and at the end, I get a, a very weird result, I could 
In the meantime, while I'm debugging, I have my code stopped. I could step line by line and then change the variable to whatever nonsense was happening and see what happens with my code with that nonsense. So I could do that live. Um, Chanji, you have a, a question there. Well, comment first. It beats Yo. message boxes all over the place. Oh, man. <laughs> that destroys message boxes. Which is my current <laughs> debugging method, so I have to give this a shot. Oh, man. Wow. Uh, trust me, I understand. This, this might be a little unrelated, but I don't... If in some other languages, Visual Studio will warn you about unused variables and unreachable code, do you know it has to happen for AutoHotKey to have a similar feature? Is that just part of the language definition or is there built-in tools tooling that has to happen? No, so basically it has to do with the language itself. Actually, if you use AutoHotKey version two, which is the alpha version, it comes with that by default and you can turn off the warnings uh, by using a, a directive. So basically exactly what you're asking for they are working on it for version two of our own. And so it is a language thing. It is not about the tools that we're using. Um, but in any case, I did want to point out something that you mentioned, like it beats uh, um, uh, message boxes. Of course it does, because these message boxes are not for debugging. They are message boxes. Um, but the only thing is, and one quick interesting thing is that in the editor, in VS Code, if you paused your script and you are in debug mode and your script is paused, whenever you put your mouse on top of a variable, it tells you what that variable has. And that, my friend, is something that is next level when you're debugging. Because- I've honestly never noticed that. Oh, my friend, yes. Uh, so if you are, for example, debugging this thing here, and as, I, as you can see, it has a long list lines of code. You don't want to be taking a look, and I'm gonna show you why. This is, I don't know how many people have, uh, how much uh, people have thought about this, but um, let me make a break here, reload. Um, oh, you, to, do, to get that feature, you have to have the debugger going. It yes. won't do it. No, it, okay. it is not whenever you are, so you, you have to have the debug and it has to be paused. So it has to be I in the it's stepping through, it. right? So yeah, very likely. Now, the funny thing, I don't know if you have noticed, like a lot of people arguing about global variables and local variables, right? And most of the programmers, especially in AutoHotKey, don't care about it. Like, I don't care, it's just a global variable. What is the problem? I'm gonna show you the problem. So here on the left side, you, as I mentioned before, you could see all the variables that are global. And when you open this, you might get a very huge list of normal global variables that the script defines, plus whatever that developer decided is a good thing to have. And he's, you're gonna have a list of thousands of variables, right? And, and that's a problem. Now, you have a little function here, say for example, um, you have the destroy all clip wins, right? Some programmers decide to use global variables inside this function. I have seen this. And it's a, it's a nightmare for debugging because you don't know where the hell that variable was declared and a lot of things. Of course, VS Code makes that easy with you know, jumping to whatever was declared. It makes it a little bit easier, but you don't want to deal with that. Uh, with thousands of global uh, variables. What you, and as you can see up here, you have local. What happens is whenever you enter into a function, it is only going to show you the variables in this list that are local to that function. That's the reason why you want to set up as many local variables as you want, because it filters it out for you automatically, okay? And, Again, this is a part that not many people use, but here on the left side, you have the call stack, which is kind of like a way that tells you how you reached that specific part of the program. So whenever you enter into a function and you want to know how you got there, the call stack 
actually goes from bottom to top is, is actually reversed and it tells you which functions were called to get to that line. That's what it is. So again, this, this whole thing, this debugging uh, environment uh, changes just wanna, the game. Do you want to show that example where you were talking about, you know, in the compiled version or zip file, you know, where you have the actual files in one spot, but not in the other? Oh, all right. Yeah, that, that has to do with Git. So, so basically, uh, <laughs> yeah. Why would you want to use Git, for example? And, and one kind of like very obvious example of what is going on. Um, here in this same project, I do have several branches. I have my master branch, which is kind of like, um, I'm sorry for the noise in here, um, but this is the master branch. This is kind of like a public thing, whatever people can see. I have my development branch, with, with, which is where I'm working on something. And I have a very special um, branch that is called public releases. Now, in public releases, what I want to do is have a zip file that contains my executable and a version file, nothing else. Now, I don't want to have multiple folders going around and trying to sync everything. What I do in Git is that um, if I let me let me show you what it looks like. So let me go ahead and open this file. It opens directly. So this is what my folder looks like. I have my HK file, my versioning file, the resource folder that contains some things in there, um, libraries and stuff like that. Um, I keep the library for some reasons, uh, but in general, I don't need anything else. I don't need the HK. I don't need the resource folder. I don't need them there. What I need is a zip file and my version file. In, when I hear down here, I click on switching my branches and I go to my public releases, you will see that my files get switched automatically. I only have my zip file and my version file. What I wanted to demonstrate with this is that each branch is kind of like a whole different world. You can keep very weird stuff in a branch that has nothing to do with your main branch. And Git and basically VS Code automatically does everything for you. You just have to click here and say, let me go to my developer branch and everything is switched for me. I don't have to do anything, you know? I'd also mention uh, GitHub pages kind of encourages that for documentation. So you can have a branch that is for the GitHub pages and you can just switch about it. And yeah, that's that's, that's good to Thank have you, it. In, I got to write yeah, Not a problem. Um, I hope you time. know this was helpful, right? I don't <laughs> think we uh, we mentioned earlier. I don't think you mentioned, which I know we've done several times on stuff that we're working on our projects too. Stop following uh, certain files in a folder. Like you're like, hey, these aren't really relevant. I don't want those included. Right. Yes. To do that, um, you just have to create a file that is called git ignore with a dot in front dot git ignore that's the only thing that you have to do and in there you can uh, put the name of the file that you don't want to be tracked um and uh you wildcard. can use you can use wildcards and stuff like that so basically um this this uh, the zip file is not going to be tracked and when i mean tracked is that each snapshot i take doesn't care if that file changed or not. That's just to, so for example, the version file, I don't want to keep track of it. And if you go to, if I, pub, if I publish this repository on GitHub and people download my uh, repository, those files are not gonna show up in whatever they download. The files that they're gonna have are the ones that I decide they could have. Um, and in this case would be the, uh, HK folder, uh, the resources, but I don't want them having my version file because that is of, right. of, is of no use to them. And for example, when we were testing the, the script, right? So I'm testing it right now. And I think um, if I take a screenshot, right? So this screenshot creates a file, if I remember correctly, a, a BMP file. I don't want everybody that downloads my uh, script 
grabbing it or getting that BMP file because I was just testing. So I have in my ignore file, I get ignore, I have anything that is JPEG or BMP will be ignored. So whenever I download the, the, the repository, they don't have that. Cool. Yeah. Oh, you know what? And I, I think it was Jean asked about search replace. Does that work well? Um, yes, but in a way that I'm not used to. So control H, of course, is gonna bring your, your um, uh, search and replace. Of course, now you have these buttons here to either match case, uh, match the whole world, word or use regular expressions. Each of them have their own hotkeys like Alt R. Um, and this is the part that doesn't work as I expect. I'm gonna show you in a second. So basically, yes, you can find include, um, replace it with includes and either replace one or replace all. Okay, so you could do that. Now, sometimes I want to do a replacement just in the selected text. And that's what that button is all about. Now, sometimes what I have found is that this button does not get automatically selected when I do the next search. I, don't, I haven't figured out if it is a bug or if it is just that something that I, I'm not um, um, used to. So if I have this search and now I select a different list and hit control F, now I, it is still grabbing tray on the other locations. You see that? Mm -hmm. Not in the currently selected right. thing. Right. So it is something that kind of like goes back to whatever I have selected. Whenever I do this thing, the selection of the, hold on, let me, let me, let me remove that. Okay, so whatever I had selected at that moment and I hit control F and I select that text, right? That's the one that's gonna be saved kind of like forever. And I don't like that. <laughs> now, it is something that as soon as I figure out what is going on, that is gonna stop annoying me. But for now, it hasn't stopped annoying me. But because every time I do this selection thing, it kind of like, I don't know, it makes my, my life a hell. And, and what, one other question I had was uh, type, type my name twice, once with an uppercase J and once with a lowercase. Joe Glines, so uh, Joe, yeah. so like this. Yeah. Now, well, actually, capitalize both Joes, and this will get to the point. So, so now, like, click on Joe, and you'll see. Hey, it recognizes the other one, but the Glines. So, it's doing a case sensitive comparison, which I don't want. Is there? Do you know? Is there a way to turn that off? Um, yeah, very likely. So if we go to the settings, you might be able to find that. Now, the, the one thing is that you will soon find out if you like this guy, is that there are thousands of uh, settings. settings. Yeah, yeah. So and hotkeys, which we've noticed. Yeah. So that's Pretty like a lot. Um, and there are user, user settings and workspace settings and a lot of, a bunch of things, but the, Good thing is that you can search. So we could actually just try and uh, put selection. So find maybe multi-line controls where the center is seated, suggestions. Uh, again, I know that there should be one, but the problem is I would have to look for it because I have an actual case. Done it. Like case sensitive. Case, right. So editor. Reveal if open. New window features for the search, maybe no. Case insensitive if the partner is on that's smart case for search features. So I, what I do then is that I just go to the features, search, very likely is here. Yeah, it's very likely here because this is for the search integration case. And again, let's see if it says case insensitive. Let me see, hold on. No, that, I mean, that is for the search. When I like the when IntelliSense I, highlighting. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, so that is something that I would have to figure out which setting yeah. is the one that controls that, but I haven't uh, played you know, with that site, before. Site doesn't allow you it it um, to change it. And when I was talking to Maestri on Studio, he's like, oh, should I change it? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 not case no. I, I don't no. want, you know, I don't uh, want. No, no, so, so that is something that as 
I could say that it's very highly likely that you can change it uh -huh. because one thing that you can do with this editor is modify it almost completely. And if, in, even if you don't have the setting here, you could probably hack it right. uh, because yeah. uh, there are there's another way that you can actually uh, yeah, I looked at do some your own, like snippets. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, it is kind of like a, a file that you could add specific commands to it, which oh. is uh, right. One other question, which I wanted to answer was, is and this is to me it's so darn confusing because look at the, look at the title screen like it says Visual Studio Code, right? Oh, uh, you're talking about here on the top. Yeah, but right. as we said, this is VS Code, right? All right. Yeah, well, that's what it is, VS Code. Right now, what you're what you're uh, confusing it with is Visual Studio. So, Visual Studio is an integrated development environment that has a lot of things and it is designed specifically for certain languages like C++, JavaScript and some other things. And it is designed to leverage, uh, leverage a lot of things of those languages in an easy way. And that is Visual Studio. And it has its own editor. Now, Visual Studio Code has nothing to do with Visual Studio. That's a different thing. Now, Visual Studio Code is an editor that is general, it is multi-purpose. You can use it with many languages. That's the reason why we're using it with AutoHotKey. Now, good luck doing that with Visual Studio. <laughs> Even though you can, it's like overkill. Now, Visual Studio is designed for huge projects, like very large projects enterprise level projects, which has a lot of dependencies, a lot of different things, and it helps you manage those things easily between teams. Visual Studio Code is for me. It's just for one programmer that is gonna do whatever he wants to do and, you know, and the main idea is the integration with Git. The Git and debugging, that, those are the two core things of Visual Studio Code. Anything else is not added here. You will find a bunch of features in Visual Studio that are not in Visual Studio Code because Visual Studio is more complete. It's actually a very huge tool. This is kind of like a subset of that tool, which is the editor, by the way. Yeah, it no, can be confusing, true. but yeah. It's just they but, should have named it something, you know, something at least. <sighs> But anyway, I yeah. would I would have thought the same. Yes, uh, like why would you call it Visual Studio Code? Maybe because they didn't want to use the Atom name or um, or the thing, and they wanted to kind of like brand it to their own things because this is Microsoft. Uh, and one reason why people are jumping to this thing is because it is very reliable because it's a Microsoft thing, right? That's the that's the main point, right? Cool. Does anyone else have any other questions? A lot of big thank yous. Yeah, it's 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 like I said. I've been watching you use it. It's it's pretty amazing. Um, awesome stuff. Excellent. So, um, in any case, uh, again, this boils down to preference. Much right. uh, many people will rather have a specific uh, 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 editor or whatever. Now. I just showed this in case somebody's interest, interested in the features that it has, but there are some things that are lacking. So if you have an editor that has other features that this one doesn't have, well, that's okay. You can use both <laughs> or you can use only that one. It doesn't matter. It is just one more preference. That's it. Yeah, I was going to mention, you know, I, I think our, other than the, the, the um, first auto hockey survey uh, uh, webinar we did, the first webinar was on AHK Studio, right? And then later we did one on site for AutoHotKey. Um, and now we just had this one. And then we're planning one more on Notepad++, um, which I know is a very popular editor for... Yeah. I'm not going to say it. It, 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 just, <laughs> it is. Uh, it's a popular <laughs> just of that. Um, it, right. it, it's, it's missing some core functionality that to me, I'm like... Right. Oh, but anyway, um, so we're going to have a, another one on that. Um, and again, to, to Isaiah's points, right? It's it's your preference of what you use and what you like. And there's a lot of really great gems in this, 
I'm still using Studio day to day because some of the functionality that I love in it, it doesn't have in this, at least not that I can tell. Um, and, 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 but um, it doesn't mean I, I probably at some point when when we get to where Isaiah and I are actually programming the same stuff, I will be using it. Absolutely. Right. Wholeheartedly. Right. No, no question. On the stuff I'm just doing myself. Yeah. I, I'm still in studio. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to tell you one thing. Uh, one of the, if I talk about the good things that it has, I can tell about the bad things that it has that I hate, like I really hate, <laughs> which is hotkeys. The hotkeys that are um, set up in this thing are not intuitive at all. Like they use this control K, control A's or control K, right. control Alt, Enter. And some things that make no sense to me. And actually, even when you, when you start, when you start up, it actually tells you like uh, to open, to like, let me show you. This was so stupid. Like to open a file, like to open a file, control O. To open a folder, control K. Control O, and then if it is to open res recent, it's Control R. And I'm like, why did you have to do that? Why not Control Shift O? Control I don't know, whatever. The I, hotkeys. Help me understand. So, does it seriously mean you have to hit Control K and, and, and control then o? Control O? No, 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 not at the same time. It is like first Control K, you let go, and then Control O. That's wackadoodle. Yeah, I I'm telling you, it's crazy. And this is. For a lot of things, you have to use the control K. So control K kind of like modifies the whole keyboard. It gets you to a second keyboard that then you can do other hotkeys on. That's okay. that's what I'm sensing on it. But it makes no sense to me why they decided control K or something else, right? Now, um, funny thing is you can change all the hotkeys, right. Right. whatever you want. And you can sign in. For example, I sign in right. with, with GitHub. I sign in with GitHub to synchronize my settings. That means that if I go to another computer and they have VS Code and I sign in, all my hotkeys are going to be imported and I could use them. And then he signs to his account and he has his, his hotkeys. So this way I could travel with my hotkeys whatever I want. And I really, really hate those hotkeys. So I just change them to whatever I feel comfortable with, right? But the, the fact that it has that really nice searchable you know, functionality helps alleviate it to some degree because yes. that's what I do at studio a lot is I just use the, that Omni search for the things I can't remember. And it, you know, right. the fuzzy search, you can pull it up very quickly. Yeah. But later, later on, you start to hate control K control S control K control M. And then you have this control K control alt S and you're like, no man, I forget about that. <laughs> Faster, just, yeah. <laughs> it's faster to change the hotkey than to actually use the hotkey. <laughs> it is true. Yeah. No, but you know. Um, Thank you. This was really great overview. Um, I think a lot of people saw the, the value in it. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. I hope that uh, you guys enjoyed it or learned something new. Some I, I, I read somebody saying like, I've been using this for three years and I didn't see yeah. that. And I was like, yeah. Jackie, I'm curious in your thoughts because for quite a while, you know, you 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 stuck with Site, uh, but then you switched to Studio. But and now, are you normally working in VS Code? Yeah. Okay. Um, What's your so, favorite thing about it? That's that for you is, you know, the thing you enjoyed the most. Well, one of the things that I was um, that kept me from using GitHub as a place to store my projects was that I didn't find it intuitive actually do stuff in, in the other tools with GitHub. Um, and I never learned Git from the command line. And because everything here has a menu or a hotkey or an explanation, I, I, can, I can work with it as easily as I want to. So that is the main reason. And the editor just works. I have the tells uh, that Isaiah showed who did what, when did it do it. I have all of the other functionality that I want. I can jump around in my code uh, really easily and I have a good overview of the changes that I made. So those things were things I got from other tools before, but now I have yes. this one. Um, I agree. History is probably one of the things that I love most about it. Actually being able to see I don't even need to commit. 
I can just turn on the history in my current work session and I can still see what I've done in the last hour or so. So yes, those things really. Yeah, I, Isaiah doesn't know it, but I go in and look at what he's been doing hour by hour and I'm like, what are you doing, man? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's okay. But in general, um, I have to add to whatever you said, Jackie, that um, I have never seen a GUI tool that is as comprehensive with Git as this one. You can do so many operations with this menu here that in other commands I could not do, that I would have to go to the command prompt to do. So yes, actually get, uh, this uh, VS code uses almost, I would say 80% of Git's power with this menu right here. And this is amazing because I had never seen any other tool doing that. Actually, all the other tools, it's just the basics. You can commit, you can uh, merge, you can create a branch, but if you want to rebase your stuff, now nah, you can't. And this thing actually does almost everything. I'm really surprised of it. And to, put, and to add a little bit to what you said as well, like you were used to a lot of things from other editors. And the funny thing is that when you enter to VS Code, they are there. It's not like you're missing like a long, a long list of things that, oh my God, I cannot do this. It is, it is there. It is difficult to get to them because there are so many options, right? Mm -hmm. But you can find them. And then you get used to new stuff that when you try to go to the other editor, you say like, where's my, and no, you don't have that. Then you get like, oh no, <laughs> it's annoying. You have to go to VS Code. <laughs> Yeah. I assume you can do multi-line typing and not, you know, like moving around. Right. Yeah, yes. you, yeah you can. Okay. Yeah. So if you are here in menu, you control alt down, adds more cursors down, for example, and then you could start typing. Right, but even if those weren't lined up, you could still no, do No, you can still do it. So that was a thing. Here, 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 that, here, here, here. But you couldn't, here. yeah, you couldn't move around when that studio does right. just like that. And it's phenomenal either either up or down i actually got um to to oh old shift select so for example if you have menu selected and you start selecting to the side like it it does have you ever seen in in uh notepad plus plus that you have this box select right mm -hmm. but if the words are different sizes right. it doesn't keep selecting other things it's kind of like uh very interesting how it works and after you get used to that like, uh, you don't want to change that. <laughs> like, I need that. <laughs> That's how it works. Awesome. We, we also, uh, as I mentioned, we were planning a Notepad++ webinar. And at some point, I don't know if we're going to make it a webinar or just a small group, but we're going to have, like, the people, my plan is the people that led each webinar for each tool to get together and have, like, a battle of the bands kind of thing for each, each you know, um, editor to say, okay, can you do this? Here's how I do this. How do you do that? Right? <laughs> you know, I think it would be a really fun thing to work through um, of, of, and then people can really have an informed decision of, like to me, what I say is if you're brand new to programming stuff, site for auto hockey is an amazing one because the install is so easy and so many things are right there at your fingertips. Then I'd switch to studio next. And then I, if you're working with other people, hands down, I would switch to VS Code, right? Like, right, yeah. And you might be able to write to the um, survey people what what stuff they use most in, in whichever tool they usually use, Joe. I, just a guess or an idea if you wanted to have like a battle of the bands, as you said. Well, we, yeah. Where yeah oh, no, I, no, the, I'm, you mean the functionality of each thing within the tools? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. If, if people usually use this in that and that yeah. in that. Right. If you then had uh, that side by side comparison right. between, I, this is this is what I mainly would think of like features. This is a feature that I have. Does your have it? Like just to see because sometimes what makes me decide for a tool is what features it has. So for some things I would have to use Notepad plus plus even if I don't like it because that's the tool that has that feature. So uh, again, I usually have three uh, editors installed. I have Notepad++, I have VS Code, and I have another one, um, Adam. And I just switch between them depending on what I want to do. That's all. 
which and I and I know we at least alluded to this, but um, with VS Code, one of the great things is, yeah, you yeah you can like with Site, there's over eighty languages that you can have you know to to program in um, the IntelliSense and everything, and I'm sure in VS Code right. it's yeah, it, it is it is amazing the amount of work on right. Awesome. Very well, good. thanks again, man. This was this was a really great um, review of the tool. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk right. soon. Bye. 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 Bye.